You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jane Healy. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories, the podcast where we bring you the story behind the stories and the storyteller. Author interviews, writing advice, book reviews, all sorts of great stuff. If you are a book lover, Author Stories is the place for you. We have more than 550 author interviews in our archives at hankgarner.com. Please go over there and check it out. Also, check out our YouTube channel uh, where we also have all of the episodes archived there. If you don't find an author interview that you're looking for on the website, click on the archives tab. There's a long list of them where you can click and download and listen uh, right there. I'd like to tell you about some sponsors that make the show possible. The Locust, books one to three by Ralph Kern. The Complete Locust series, an epic tale of mystery, survival, exploration, intrigue. The cruise ship MS Atlantica is lost on these strange and uncharted seas where even the compass shows the sun rising to the west. Atlantica's passengers must do what it takes to survive. The three books, Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris. Atlantica arrives in a strange new world, unable to locate land and with no way to contact home. They must find new allies, fend off relentless enemies, and discover the horrifying truth behind the Locust. The Locust box set contains all three action-packed novels in this best-selling science book. Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris, acclaimed for great characters, thrilling action, technical accuracy, and a compelling sense of mystery. Buy it today from Ralph Kern. The Locust. The Renegade Star series, books one through three from J.N. Cheney. Jace Hughes is a renegade. That means taking almost any job that comes his way, no matter the situation. So long as he can keep his ship floating, he's free to live the life he wants. But that all changes when he meets Abigail Pryor, a nun looking for safe passage out of the system. Too bad there's something off about the cargo she's carrying. Jace knows he shouldn't ask too many questions, but when odd sounds start coming from inside the large metal box, he can't help but check it out. Big mistake. The Renegade Star box that includes the first three books in the series, 900 plus pages, 300 plus five star reviews. Find out why people are so intrigued by this thrilling science fiction epic. You won't believe the twists and turns this series takes or the secrets that get revealed. The Renegade Star series, get the entire box set on Amazon or audiobook from audible.com there's links to it in the show notes well thanks for joining me again for the other stories podcast where i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers today i'm really excited to have jane healy on the show with me today jay fantastic new book called the beantown girls and it's a book i'm sure uh that you're gonna love uh welcome to the show jane Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. that. When I was in third grade, I wrote a story called um, Fat Fireman um, for the little school newspaper. My grandfather was a firefighter and it was about firemen that, um, ate too many donuts and couldn't slide down the fire pole <laughs> in emergencies. And I had that published. That was my first publishing experience. And honestly, I've been hooked ever since. I've always wanted to do this. Oh my gosh. That is fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah. so when, when did you write that story? When I was in third grade. I love it. Where was it published? Yeah, just in my little, um, my school, the Dallin school elementary newspaper. <laughs> yeah. That is fantastic. I yeah. love that so much. Um, so was there a teacher or uh, you know, some administrator or something that, that you kind of recognized this, this storytelling uh, thing that you had? Yeah, I think um, more than one teacher along the way, but that, that year it was um, Mrs. Dolliver, my third grade teacher. But yeah, all, all along I've definitely been encouraged by some great teachers. My um, AP English teacher in high school, Mr. Trevisani was, was one that, 
um, was, you know, really, really encouraged my writing and for me to continue with, with my writing, um, which I have in various capacities, but I, had, I didn't start publishing fiction until a couple of years ago. But we really owe that third grade teacher a debt of gratitude then, don't Oh, we? thank you. Yeah, <laughs> she was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Um, were you a big reader as a kid? I really was, yeah. Um, and I read everything, but I, I really, I obviously jo- enjoyed historical fiction. I loved Laura Ingalls Wilder, all those books. Um, but I also loved um, fantasy, like uh, Madeline L'Engle, A uh, Wrinkle in Time. I still have my like old tattered copy on my shelf. Um, Susan Cooper, The Dark is Rising series, that was another one I just adored. So yeah, I was always a huge reader. Nice. Um, so, so fantasy, um, did, uh, was there, was there a certain book or a certain genre that when you discovered it, uh, it changed your life? I think, oh, you know, I mentioned Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time and, um, the character, the main character, Meg, is a really smart, um, precocious girl and, um, really into academics and learning. And, um, I just, recognize myself in her that was the first character that I really recognized myself in that character and I just I adored that book and I adored the writing and I connected with the story so much that that really you know that was probably one of the books that I was like oh I would love to be able to do this someday right Right. Um, you said that you, you only came back to fiction a couple of years ago. Um, what was your what was your life trajectory before uh, coming back to fiction? Uh, yeah, well, I, um, you know, went to college and grad school, and I thought I was going to go continue in a higher ed and get my PhD, but um, but then I realized the bureaucracy and the um, sort of time it would take. I didn't want to be um, in huge student loan debt for the rest of my life, so I ended up in high. I kind of ended up in high tech. Um, one thing I tell younger women who are interested in writing fiction, I'm like, well, you can do that always and work on it on the side like I have been doing for many years but I said you, you know they need good communicators in high tech as well and if you're a good writer you can there's some great jobs um, in the tech industry so I ended up being a product manager in high tech um, and then when my girls were born they're 12 and 15 I started freelance writing um, you know staying at home with them and doing a lot of freelance work for from newspapers and magazines and sometimes private clients um, but always kind of uh, you know, uh, very much on the side working on different fiction projects or going to fiction workshops or sharing pages with, you know, my writers group. We all met at Boston Magazine as young moms. So, um, so yeah, I've always sort of kept my, kept one foot in that world, but also pursued other things career wise. I love it when, when people that work in high tech write historical fiction. Um, there's, there's something, um, you know, we, we make assumptions about people. Um, so she's yeah. a product manager and she works in a high tech <laughs> right. company. She's going to write science fiction. No, oh, right, she's, right. you know, you, you know, um, I, I, I love that, that people have such varied interest and, in, and in, uh, it's so easy to, to assume, um, the things that people are passionate about. But the, the reality is we can be passionate about a whole host of things and, and be the same person. I think that's one thing that fiction, uh, brings out that, uh, that we could learn a lot about each other from. I think that's true. I think, you know, um, and I loved my time in high tech and, and learning about new technologies. And I was with a lot of startups, but, um, you know, I've always, you know, I was a political science major in college. I've always adored history and politics and, um, and historical fiction, obviously. And, and so, yeah, I mean, everyone's got, you know, all their different interests and it's yeah, like you said, it's, you can box people in, but, but uh, people are a lot more complex than than, than that. Um, you mentioned um, uh, writing for the magazine. What was what was the draw there that that got you into um, you know essay writing and and feature writing? Well, you know, it was um, it was. It's funny when you you know I, I knew that I wanted to have a like fam- more family friendly career where my daughters were born, and and it's fun when you're starting out in freelancing. As I say, uh, you know, I talk at libraries and stuff. You just, you really just take whatever jobs anyone will throw your way. <laughs> you know, so I started <laughs> doing like, you know, very tiny, tiny book reviews, and then I started writing, you know, um, for wedding magazines about flower trends, and you know, and it and it grew from there um, to essays and and longer pieces, and um, and like I said, I've also, you know, 
I've also done private client work, but I, but I really did enjoy, um, you know, doing freelance journalism. I worked, you know, did some stuff for Huffington Post and um, MainStreet.com, you know, a bunch of different um, online and offline uh, print publications too. Um, I, I had a similar experience. I started writing a, a column for our local newspaper, and then that kind of grew into some other long form essays, and then uh, you know blogging on some different sites and things like that. And 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 I look back, and even though those early things had nothing to do with what I do now, seemingly um, th- those are places that you kind of learn to hone your skill and, and kind of get your chops. And uh, how do you yeah. feel like writing that sort of stuff has affected you as a fiction writer? I think it's so, I think any writing you do, um, you know, makes you a better writer, whether, and even in, even though I was writing nonfiction, then it teaches you about discipline and sticking to a deadline and be, being able to back up your work with, with hard research, you know, um, history, you know, one thing I take pride in is doing meticulous research and, and even though it's fiction, I want to get the facts right. And that, you know, the fact checking and, and, and the things like that in journalism teach you to, to be really meticulous in that way. And also, like I said, you know, writing to deadline, um, I think is so important. Learning, learning that even when you're not feeling inspired, you still have to sit down and do the work, um, right. you know, on the hard days. Right. Right. Um, Boston uh, factors uh, heavily uh, in your work, and as it, it, well, the, you know, the title of your your newest book uh, kind of reflects that. Um, are, are you originally from Boston? I am originally from Boston, and I live um, about seven miles north of the city now. Um, yeah, so the, in the Beantown Girls, the three main characters are friends from Boston, um, but the the story actually takes place in the European theater of operations during World War II. And um, my first novel was called The Saturday Evening Girls Club, and that was based on a true story of Jewish and Italian immigrant women in Boston's North End at the turn of the 20th century. I was, I was, that was going to be my next question, The Saturday Evening Girls Club. That began uh, as an article that you wrote for a magazine, right? Exactly, yeah. You know, we were talking about different freelance jobs, and my um, editor at Boston Home called me one day and She's like, oh, do you have any interest in antiquing? Do you collect? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I have toddlers. Like, I don't collect anything that can break. <laughs> so, no. And she was like, well, you know, I really need you to do this, you know, bi-monthly column on antiquing. <laughs> so I was like, okay, here we go. That's fine. Right. And, makes um, perfect and then, sense. I'm sorry? And said, yeah, that makes perfect sense with toddlers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, nothing that can break. Everything above, you know, going to keep it on the high shelf. Um <laughs> And so, um, yeah, I started, I, I wrote about New England area antiques. And one of my, I think my third column was on Saturday Evening Girl Pottery, which is also called Paul Revere Pottery. Because um, this group of women had this pottery that, um, even though they never really did well financially at the time, it has become highly collectible. Like, people just adore it. It's a, an example of the arts and crafts movement of the early 20th century. And um, people just love it. That's fantastic. We're we're actually recording this the the Tuesday after the Super Bowl. I would imagine where you live is kind of ridiculous right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> yes, and I met my husband and uh, he works downtown Boston last night, and all the buildings are re- still lit up in red, white, and blue, and um and there the parade is going through downtown today. And you know, last week it was negative one, and this week it's fifty seven degrees here. So the city is just packed with fans <laughs> partying and, and drinking like first thing in the morning today. So, um, yeah, pre- people are pretty fired up still. That's so funny. Mm-hmm. Um, it, even though your your new book, The Beantown Girls, doesn't take place in Boston, um, the the characters are Bostonians, and the that flavor um, of that they bring to the story is is definitely Boston. Um, what do you think it is that is uniquely Boston um, that that separates it and its people um, from from everyone else? Um, I think that, you know, we're pretty proud of our culture around here and our history, um, you know, and obviously our sports teams, as evidenced by this week. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that, yeah, there, there was, you know, when the girls go overseas, 
you know, people, they meet other soldiers from Boston and there's that in, immediate connection. I think that, um, yeah, we're, we're pretty, uh, you know, pretty um, proud of our roots. And I, you know, and I've even noticed in, um, in the Saturday Evening Girls Club and now with the Beantown Girls, like um, the people of this area are just so pumped about these books because they celebrate our history. And, um, and, it, and it's been really wonderful. You know, the, the response has been really wonderful from people around here. What was it about the Saturday Evening Girls Club that that really made that story come alive to you? And you wrote the the feature piece for it that eventually, um, you know, became uh, a novel. How did that How did that kind of unfold for you? Well, you know, I finished. Um, I wrote the article, and um, and I was really interested in writing more about these women. I wasn't sure what that meant. I didn't know if that was going to be like a nonfiction long form article or if that was going to be a novel, but my, you know, I, I finished the article and I, I asked myself like, why hadn't I heard of this club before? Why? I mean, I, I born and bred in Boston. I would never heard of these women before. And I was bothered by that because they were kind of extraordinary for their time. It was the early 1900s. And they formed this club, cross cultural, you know, Jewish and Italian immigrant women. And um, the Helen Starro, the, one of the founders of the club, she was a big philanthropist in in Boston. We have Starro Drive here in town that's based named after her family. Edith Gruyere, the local librarian, formed this club for these women to really give them an informal higher education and mentor them and help them you know, help them realize their own versions of the American dream. And, uh, you know, this was early, you know, 1908. So there was, there wasn't a lot for young women at that time who were intellectually curious or ambitious or wanted to rise above their station in life. And this club provided that in a really unique way that, um, that I had had, you know, people still ask me like, well, sure, certainly there was clubs like this around the country. And I, I said, no, that it, there wasn't. And that's what made it so unique. And that was what intrigued me about the story. So it's really a story, um, a, a true story of this, yes. this club, this group of people that really kind of cut across um, uh, you know, people at different stations in life, people um, at different uh, I, I, I want to say careers, but that, that's probably not um, di- different places in. Uh, and it was these these people helping one another. Uh, what a yes. what a fascinating um, concept. What the, it, it, why does it sound so foreign? You know, but it's it's such right, a, right. a fascinating thing for a hundred years ago. Yeah, for a hundred years. I mean, you know, in in these neighborhoods, like you know, Italians kept it with Italians and Jewish families kept with Jewish families, but um, because these these women were younger and most of them were born in this country or came over as babies, they were able to cross those cultural divides. And and then there's the socioeconomic aspect where Helen Starro was an incredibly wealthy woman, but took interest in these young immigrant women who were poor at a time when a lot of her friends in the upper classes were nativists. They were anti-Semitic and they were anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant and but she was very progressive for her time and really um changed these girls lives i mean in, in the book i talk about how one of them received a scholarship from helen starro to go to college which is pretty rare back then but she provided college scholarships for a number of those women those real women were you surprised that their story had not been properly told i was really surprised and a little bit bothered you know like i yeah. can't they were kind of extraordinary. I, I can't believe that um, that their story hasn't been given enough, uh, given it more attention in history. Um, but that I think sometimes happens, and that's kind of how the you know the same. I felt the same way when I came across the story of the Clemobile Girls in World War II. I was bothered that I that they haven't been recognized for um, the real heroes that they were. Right. Um, when you find a story like that and it's so powerful and so significant, um, you know, I, what are the challenges in, in writing a fictional story about these real people and, um, real heroes, um, you know, if you will, that, um, uh, where you want to tell an engaging story and you also want to be really true to, to honor, um, you know, what these people have done? I, I think that's a great question. I think that's the balance. Like you have to strike yeah. the right balance between what is historic, historically accurate and authentic to the time and the place and the people, and but also create an, a fictional narrative that will entertain and 
and inspire and delight readers. Um, and striking that balance is hard. And I think that you know every scene I'm you know scene by scene, and when I write something all, all along the way, I always I'm constantly asking myself like, is this historically accurate? If it didn't happen, could it have happened? Is it you know organic to the time and the place? And does it feel authentic? Um, that's I think that's the those are the biggest questions that I'm I'm constantly thinking about as I write. And I I I really envy um, historical fiction writers and and ones like you that really pull it off so well and 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 make it feel so authentic. Um, to to me, it seems like one of the hardest things would be um, when you're. Uh, when you're working on these characters, emotional choices and, and the, the interpersonal interactions, uh, to be careful not to, um, set things in motion that would change history. Um, is that something that you ever think about when, when maybe dealing with conflict with characters or uh, introducing people to situations and other people that might not have really happened? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You, you don't want to think about, you, you want to make sure you would never do something that would um, change history in any way. And also you want to make sure that the characters behave, um, behavior and the way they speak and the, it, it all feels like authentic to the time and place. It doesn't feel like, you know, that I, I like even with the dialogue, you don't want it to sound like, you know, people talking in 2018 when it's taking place in 1944 and sometimes those are just like very small nuanced things but it's important to get it right or it throws the reader out of the story because they're like wait that doesn't sound right you know so um so yeah I'm, i'm constantly thinking about that kind of thing uh the saturday evening girls club was uh picked up by lake union i believe it was um and published last year what was the what was the path like to get to that point I, I, well, my, that path was really um, long and winding, as I say in my talk. <laughs> as I, as I most think, of us are. Yeah, Yeah, I think most authors have their own long and winding stories. Um, I tried to get it published about six years ago now, and I did, did. I went through the whole process. I queried a number of agents, over 50. Um, I had a lot of strong responses, a lot of requests for full manuscripts, I felt like momentum was on my side. I thought I was going to get signed, and I ultimately did not get signed with an agent then. Um, and then fast forward to two years ago, and I felt like the market was better for histor- for you know immigrant stories, American historical fiction. I just feel like that, you know, with um, successive bo- books like Orphan Train and Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, I, I felt like you know what I'm going to try to get this manuscript out there one more time. And I think publishing is, is persistence and it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of timing. And, and so this time it happened for me, but, but it took, you know, like I had put it on the shelf and almost given up on it. Um, and, but I'm really glad that I didn't. Absolutely. Um, so after that book came out and, uh, was well received, uh, when did the, the idea for Beantown Girls, the Beantown Girls come to you and, and was, what was the, the the kernel that that brought this story to you and and uh, as it came to life. Um, great question. So um, I it, it was like nine questions. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll try to answer all of them. And um, so I was, you know, trying to sort of start thinking about what I wanted to write next, and uh, you know what I wanted to pitch to like Union for my next project. I wanted to write a big story. I wanted to write World War II because that era has always kind of fascinated me. My grandfather was a World War II vet. Um, and I was kind of searching around, doing a little research here and there. I came across this picture. I think it was on Pinterest of these four women in Europe standing in a field, kind of laughing with each other. They were wearing these uniforms I didn't quite recognize. And it said, you know, the caption was, you know, Red Cross Club Mobile Girls in such and such England, 1944. And, I, and my first question was, who were the Club Mobile Girls? Like, what's a Club Mobile? And it, it turns out it was Red Cross Clubs on Wheels, and basically converted trucks, the equivalent of modern day food trucks, actually. That you know, and these women would drive around and drive to the front lines of the war, serving coffee and donuts and playing music and trying to boost troop morale because you know, morale was one of the biggest problems in the military during World War II. And so I, the more digging I did, the more 
the question started coming up as it did with the Saturday evening girls. Well, how can, how come I haven't heard about these women? I just can't even believe that all, all of the amazing things they did. And, and I just have never heard about them before. So I, um, that, that once again was like sort of the string that I had to pull to, to, um, you know, start the research and, and jump into this project. It's such a common thread here that there's these fantastic women uh, doing amazing things and, and they just get glossed over in the yeah. in the telling of history. And that, that's one thing that I, I, I love about this. Um, I, I don't know if resurgence is the right word, but there, there we do seem to have a lot of really great uh, historical fiction coming out now, especially around this time period. Um, and I think, you know, that, that we are in, in, uh, in trouble in, in danger of, of losing the narrative, um, around, um, some of these stories because the farther we get away from a historical event, uh, and, you know, most of the veterans that served during that time and, and all the people that supported them, uh, are, you know, are, are leaving us. And yeah. the, the farther we get away from that, the more uh, a historical event gets reduced to to bullet points. Um, yep, you know, exactly. th- this happened at this battle. This happened at the signing of this treaty. And we lose the human story around yeah. it. And, and and that's what I love about this is we're, we're rediscovering all of these fantastic stories of people that did amazing things. I, women that went to the front lines of battle to to bring a food truck just to you know to make people happy that is that is that's one of the best war stories ever thank you yeah i i thought so too thank you very much and i i it's funny when i started doing the research i'm at schlesinger library at harvard university which is really close to me um they have just amazing archive material of american women's history and so i started looking and i was like oh do you have anything on these women and they actually had 13 boxes of archived material of diaries and letters and pictures and ration cards and, you know, training manuals. And, uh, and as I started reading and going through the material, I, it was clear to me from the, first of all, some of these women were amazing writers, beautiful writers. And it was clear to me that they knew that they were witnessing history. They were very aware of that and they were trying to capture it whether it was for their families, for themselves, but they, you know, they just wrote these beautiful detailed letters and these very detailed diaries. And, um, and, and it made it um, so, so much fun. First of all, the research was really it, it's so fantastic, but also um, it really drove the narrative um, for me. I mean, it would really, you know, I won't, I won't say the story wrote itself because it certainly did not. It was very hard, but, um, <laughs> but the research was, it was, I, so much more than I had with the Saturday Evening Girls because it was in the 1940s, not 1908. You know, there was just so much more material available to me. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to tell a story, um, kind of a faceless story about um, uh, about these women and the the club mobile uh, th- that whole kind of um, you know happening that that happened there. But it's a it's an entirely different thing to put a face. Uh, on it uh, and a name. Uh, that, tell me about Fiona Denning and uh, how did she come to you in this story? Uh, you know, I, I'd read about all these women and all their different personalities, the real women, the real Red Cross Club and real g- girls. And, um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted the three main characters to reflect some of the um, qualities and um, backgrounds of, of and also actually some of their supporting characters as well of, of the real women. So they, Fiona is kind of a composite of some of the different women I read about. One of them that, that I read about Elizabeth Richardson um, comes to mind when I think of, you know, Fiona and sort of developing her as a character. It's, it's, Liz Richardson was really um, well liked. She was a natural leader and, um, and very intelligent and, really took to the job you know she really um it was hesitant at first when she went over there but really it really flourished as time went on and um, came into her own and so i wanted i think fiona is probably most like elizabeth richardson in terms of the real club mobile girls and that she was a leader she she loved the job more than she ever thought she would and um and really found herself as as time went on 
Um, what did you learn um, in this book, uh, in the writing of it, that really surprised you and maybe made you think differently uh, about the, the time, the climate, um, how the war affected more um, than just the soldiers on the front line? Uh, were there things in the story that really um, just made you sit back and, and kind of wow at what happened? Um, yes, yes, so many things. Um that there were even women allowed on the front lines. They had, these women had more access than um, war correspondents and actually most soldiers. They could go in and out of the front lines. Um, they, the military gave them a lot of freedom. And, the, and actually that brings to mind another point. I didn't realize how closely aligned um, the military and the Red Cross were, how much they worked really hand in hand on supporting the troops and, um, and how much the Red Cross was involved in 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 the war efforts you know not only on the home front but um on the front lines um that was really interesting to me as well um another point that um i wanted to make is uh, you know one of the theme not themes but one of the things that kept coming up in these letters and diaries i was reading is a lot of these women talked about living in what they called the bubble of war with these soldiers and it was and these soldiers and these women all realized that you know Times were really hard. War was hard. It could be heartbreaking and um, demoralizing, but they really tried to live for the the moments of joy and reprieve and and comfort. And and whether that was you know jitterbugging in a field in the middle of the night or you know <laughs> having some coffee, cigarettes, a rough fire, they really tried to embrace those um, those brief moments of happiness, and and they didn't take them for granted. And I think that's what helped them survive ultimately. I love that. Um, Jane, how has your writing process changed uh, after the first novel and then uh, you know, writing the Beantown Girls? Um, your, uh, the, the time between the first novel and this one uh, is a lot shorter than the time you had before publishing the first one. Um, how has the, the way you do the work of writing changed? Um, this one, you know, is a whole different experience because I had to write a book on deadline and like I said, I think my freelance writing experience, working on deadlines, certainly prepared me. But it's nothing like writing a novel on deadlines. <laughs> that, that was a that was a new challenge for me. But um, I just so I really had to be very disciplined. And I'm def, you know some people I know uh, you know you're you're writing people talk about plotters versus pantsers, and write you know outlining versus not outlining. I I. And was really thorough not only in my research but in my outlining um, so that I had a, a road map. Now that doesn't mean the story didn't change sometimes or evolve a little bit but I, I like to have a road map for where I'm going you know beginning middle end and um, so I was really um, I just had to work really hard to stay dis- disciplined and like I said you know on those days that you feel like the words aren't coming, you still got to sit down and try to crank out as much as you can. And, um, and, and I just planned it out like that, you know, chapter by, you know, how many chapters a week I needed to get done. And if I was behind, I'd work all weekend on it to make sure that I, that I hit the number of chapters I needed for the following week and, um, and, you know, just got the work done. But it was, you know, when I signed that contract, um, my agent was like, do you need another month or two? Because I wrote it in about <laughs> seven months. And I'm like, no, I'll be fine. And then afterwards, I panicked. I'm like, why didn't I ask for another month or two? <laughs> what is wrong with me? But uh, but it, it worked out okay in the end. That's uh, so funny. Um, when you're when you're writing a book like this and uh, and and you have r- real people and real um uh, events that you're that you're working the story around. Um, I, I would uh, I, I would presume that, like you said, that you were a pretty uh, serious outliner. Um, did you ever? Uh, well, did you? How much research did you do before the writing? Um, and how much did did you ever get to a point in the writing where you just have to make a note in the manuscript, like I, I've got to I've got to do some more research about this and 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 come back to it? Did, did you ever come to places like that where you're like, I just don't know enough here to, to fully write this scene. Um, you, you know, I did um, I did most of my research before it. I, actually, before I even, um, before I submitted the proposal for the synopsis, I, I had already done a bulk of the research. Um, then I did um, even more before I started writing it when I was on deadline. And um, I felt, you know, in the outline, 
I had all the basic historical framework and research that I needed. But sometimes when, when I was writing, it's more like the little details that, um, you know, as I was writing, I'd end up going on down a rat hole about, um, you know, women's dress fashions because I wanted to, like, have some, like, very specific details about certain dresses that they were wearing on their day, their one day off of the, you know, month or whatever. You know, there were different things like that. Um, and geography was another one, geography and street names. Like, I wanted to make sure, um, you know, they are in London for a time. I wanted to make sure I got all of the geography right for that because people, that matters to people. Historic, historical fiction readers, um, you know, they're sticklers, and they, they'll call you on it. If you get something <laughs> yes. wrong, you will hear about it. So, yeah, yes, I mean, you it was, will. those details, I, um, you know, that's the type of stuff as I was writing that I'd have to kind of take pause and be like, okay, I have to – make sure I have these little details right or else the fact checkers and copy editors are going to come back at me anyway. So let's get it right now. You know, exactly. Exactly. Um, Jane, I absolutely love what you're doing. Uh, the Beantown girls is fantastic. I think, um, that this, this book, um, appeals to, um, I think a, a very broad audience, um, because there's something there for everybody. Um, what do you hope, um, when people finish the book and they, they close the, the back cover, um, what do you, what do you hope that they're left with? Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind words too. I mean, I, I'm thrilled that, um, that you loved it. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a couple of things I want people to take away. One is, um, having an appreciation of, these women in history and what they what they did for our country and what they went through, and also though um, this is a story I think about um, friendship and love and um, changing when you know changing your mind when you change your mind you can change your life like these women were home in Boston feeling a little bit left out of the war efforts and wanting to do something to contribute when they were seeing their brothers and classmates and friends all go off to war and they took this risk and this chance and it was um, terrifying, but it also changed the trajectory of their lives in really amazing ways. And uh, that it did. And, uh, and the rest of us too, um, uh, you know, you can't separate um, the contributions of, uh, uh, you know, of the club mobile girls from, from the, the history that we all enjoy now. And it's, I just love finding out about some, uh, new group of people that I had no idea about, but that, that we're, that, that connect us all in, in some strange way. Um, so I love that you wrote the book. I'm, I'm glad that you discovered, um, the, the story to tell. Um, Jane, if people are just, learning about you and want to, you know, find out more about what you do and, uh, you know, get into your, your back catalog and follow along. Is there a place where they can find you online? Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you again for all, for all your kind words. I really, really appreciate it. Um, they can find me at janehealy.com. Um, my last name is H-E-A-L-E-Y. And I am on Twitter and Instagram at Healy Jane and on um, Facebook, Jane Healy Books. Great. Uh, we'll put links to it, uh, all of the places where they can connect with you in the show notes. Uh, Jane, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Hank. This has been awesome. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. Find all the archives at hankgarner.com. Now, stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I was walking through the woods between Wolfert's Roost and the future site of my father's stone manor house. The house would eventually stand on what had been old Baltus's pumpkin field, the land where I had found my grandfather's head. Father had chosen the spot for its view of the Hudson River. Knoll was to be a grand mansion in the Gothic revival style, but at the time the mansion was but a few foundations of Van Brunt stone. I had become fond of the place already, the idea of it, and I spent many a night alone in a shack on the property. My mother disapproved. She would have me sleep in the room across from hers in our townhouse. But I was fifteen and did not answer to her. I kept a bottle of spirits hidden in the crook of two walnut trees near old Baltus's grave. I thought he would approve of the gesture. I had stopped along my way to fetch it out. At the moment the first pull of liquor touched my throat, I heard a ghastly, inhuman laugh. I was not alone in the woods. Had God sent the horseman after me? Had I sinned that terribly? I ran through the wood and found the field where Noel was to be built. 
The outline of the foundations was barely discernible beneath the snow. An apparition stood there. Though I have seen him many times since, I shall never forget my first glimpse. Gaunt in moonlight, headless, exuding power and malice. A magic thing in the land of the ordinary. The headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. What chills those words evoke. It charged at me, hatchet raised. I stood transfixed, unable to move, unable to even imagine escape. This was the servant of God, after all, sent to strike down sinners. I hurled the bottle from my hand, ashamed that I had become a drunkard as Baltus had been. It shattered against the foundations of Knoll. I stretched out my arms and awaited judgment. A piercing white light broke the darkness. The horse reared. Not my Dylan, cried Agatha, appearing from the wood. She held a skull in her hand. It shone brightly as a diamond. And in that moment I understood. The horseman did not serve God. He served my grandmother. Perhaps in that moment I came to see Agatha and God as one and the same. The unholy spirit fought her command. A foreleg of the demon horse struck my head with such power that I fell backwards with a cry and knew no more. I carry the scar to this day. A slight indentation in my temple, barely noticeable. In my days of courting I was told that when I am angry the patch of insulted skull bone will stand out in a disturbing manner. I have never had occasion to see this phenomenon, however, as I am generally well pleased whenever I pass a mirror.